coolest story uh, that ever happened to me. I used to work for a big insurance carrier years ago, and there was one customer that just was, she was super awesome, but she was probably like in her 90s. And I swear to God, this lady has survived every surgery disease known to mankind. She was like indestructible, but she's was so cool because she would always call and just curse. It wasn't offensive because she was just old enough where it was kind of just cool to hear an old person just kind of go off and start cursing. <laughs> so she would call and she'd be like, hey, you freaking asshole. You, my insurance prices went up. What the hell are you guys doing? Did you buy another house and you have to pay, you know, you need more money to pay your freaking mortgage. He would always call, call me an a-hole, you know, always <laughs> curse out whoever picked up the phone. And it was just the coolest thing ever. But she was telling me the story one time because she was actually like four foot five. Very little girl, lady, and she had survived cancer twice, had multiple surgeries, and she was just she was just indestructible, and she was still driving with road rage. So, <laughs> on the phone with her, and she was cursing me out about her rage. And uh, <laughs> next thing you know, I hear her screaming at somebody, "F you, you son of a!" And then I could just hear somebody else, "F you, you damn old lady!" And they're just cursing. She's like, you don't know me. I'll run your stupid ass off the side of the road. She goes, I got insurance. And, you know, they'll, they'll pay for it. Even if I have to pay a goddamn funeral with my with my bodily eye injury. I was like, whoa, whoa, okay. Like, I'm like, calm down, calm down. <laughs> it was just the coolest thing ever to hear this 90-year-old lady just getting into the shouting match over road rage with God knows who. And yeah. it was just one of the craziest things I had, I've ever experienced working for insurance. Just listening to this 90-year-old lady just cursing somebody on the side of the road. I heard that she actually made it successfully across the ocean with Christopher Columbus back in 1492. She she was probably the one guiding the boat. I, you yeah. know what? She, Christopher Columbus would have probably jumped over and just drowned <laughs> if she was there. She, she's just a jerk. <laughs> it was cool because, you know, she's 90 years old. And you just got to let him get away with it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but she so made, who she are you? no harm to anybody. Yeah, who are you? Sure is, dude. <laughs> What's your name? <laughs> my name is Victor Figueroa, and I'm an insurance dude. And where is your agency? <laughs> my agency is in Anaheim, California. I'm a farmer's insurance agent out in yes. uh, Anaheim Hills. Insurance dudes are on a mission to escape being handcuffed by our agencies. How? By uncovering the secrets to creating a predictable, consistent, and profitable agency sales machine. I am Craig Pretzinger. I am Jason Feldman. We are agents. We are insurance agents. What's the most famous thing in Anaheim? My agency. Definitely not the yeah. Angel Studios or Disneyland. Yes, that's or what Disneyland. I was going for. <laughs> I, I, second. I right. do have an Anaheim story that doesn't involve Disneyland. When oh. I was in high school, I went to an NWA concert at the Celebrity Theater in Anaheim. Wow. And it was something else. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Did you get me? It was, I yeah. might have been the only non gang member in the entire place. And this was like Bloods and Crips world back then. It was freaking <laughs> wild. Well, Anaheim has changed a lot. Easy E. Easy E was there, but Anaheim, Anaheim's changed a lot. I, I was, uh, I live right by the Angel Stadium. Uh huh. So around the Angel Stadium, there's Disneyland. And there used to place uh, be a nightclub called the Cowboy Boogie. Oh yeah, uh -huh. not sure. If, yeah, so that place was always freaking crazy. Harvard in Disneyland is always freaking crazy. Yeah. So you know, they had concerts and venues. Anaheim's always been a little bit of crazy, but a lot of people don't realize that because the umbrella of Disneyland. Right. But Disneyland's a freaking little crazy little town to be in. Yeah. Wasn't it like I'm old, so my time is in a tiny box at this point but maybe like 10 years ago there was a bunch of riots and all kinds of stuff in anaheim right yeah 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 so it's what happened was and, and i here so i i actually know the whole story because uh in our alley oh no way. i grew up i grew up in apartments so what happened is there was a kid and i won't say his name but for his mom and respect for him and i knew him as a little kid but then no I, he disappeared and years later I see him roaming around the neighborhood and now he's bald. He's got a big old tattoos all over the back of his head. So he went from being a skateboarder to a hardcore gangbanger. 
at least he looked the part, right? Wow. So Anaheim PD was around the time they were starting to get really rowdy about all this gang violence around the area. So they were just like pulling anybody over. And unfortunately, he fed the description, which I don't blame him because he did. And <laughs> he was in the back alley and they shot him with a shotgun and mm, unfortunately half his face went off. That really wow. ticked off a lot of people. There was a lot of like people that were upset and the family just kept on going down to that high PD. And next thing you know, there was all kinds of riots. They were burning down trash cans. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, there was like, I think another kid that was either beat up or shot or something along those lines in a neighboring city. So it was just doubling down and we had riots for days. And I remember these guys, they lit the trash can in our alley. And me and my dad were out there with the freaking fire extinguishers, just turning those things off because, you know, the, the freaking telephone pole was there. That thing had oh, on wow. fire tips over, over our apartments. So it was in everybody's best interest. I think uh, somehow it was justified, which is what caused, right? you know, the, the riots. Um, I, I didn't get to see the, the incident of what happened. Apparently, Anaheim PD felt that it was justified and they ruled it that way. But a lot of people who just from the area just were not thrilled about that. Yeah. So coming out of out of your youth, you had two choices. It was either join a gang or become an insurance agent. <laughs> you know, it's fu- it's funny you say that because <laughs> I think that if uh, some people that knew me, like my teachers, if they knew that I was an insurance agent, let alone one of like our district's better agents, <laughs> I think they would freaking not believe it. <laughs> they, I think half of them assumed that I'd be in prison somewhere. Oh, um, nice. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I, I grew up in a na- gang neighborhood. The reason why I stayed away from gangs wasn't because insurance. I didn't have no specific mentor. Frankly, my dad would really beat the shit out of me if I <laughs> if he caught me. <laughs> you know, if, if he found out that I was gang banging, so my dad would never allow that. First of all, but the problem was I had problems with the local gang because I was a little rebellious. And they, they kind of wanted to bully me around, and I wasn't one that really tolerated a lot of them. They didn't really like me, and they would always try to beat me up every chance they could. So that was probably the best thing that probably could have happened to me. Them hating me was probably the best thing because it allowed me never to kind of go that direction anyways. Don't they yeah. beat you up if you want to join too? Like, isn't that the thing? Like, they beat you up so that you can – I mean, I don't know the – the, yeah, usually, the usually they, the they have to jump you in. If you want to join the, right, uh, the brotherhood. Yeah, they usually got give it like a, a little circle in 15 seconds where everybody just kind of gets a little jabs at you. That's I a really stand that, man. If we're gonna, I mean, we're going to be brothers, man. Why, why are we starting off this way, right? But, you know, <laughs> hey, that's, that's kind of how it goes. I was asked to be a part of the gang. I declined. They started, you know, mouthing off to me. I turned around and popped one of them in the mouth. And next no thing you know, way. they all hated me. Yeah, <laughs> that was probably one of the biggest reasons why I never joined, just because they uh, they did not like me. They wanted wow. to beat me up every every second they could. I mean, and they did a lot, frankly, because, you know, I have to walk home from the bus. So there was a couple of times where I had a, they were waiting for me and, you know, gave me a little roughing. But, oh. uh, it, you know, not, no serious I injury? about it now. Eh, well, you know, I, I grew up boxing when my dad was working. Me and my older brother were dropped off at the boxing gym next to him. So, you know, I'm, 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 I, I didn't make it pro, obviously, but, you know, with the uh, average gangbanger that kind of swings all wildly, they did not really stand a chance. So do you so, think, so boxing skills translate street fight like you can use those? I don't know. I thought there was like a little bit more. A, a, a little bit. You know, a lot, usually a lot of gangbangers, especially like, well, there's, there's some pretty, there's some ones, some that can, you know, really defend themselves. Probably took a little bit of classes. The majority of them just swing very wildly. And. You know, you could have two days training, you know, in boxing and already be able to beat them. Anybody who's just swinging wildly, you know, they're just like, a, it's like a punching bag for you. What about okay. weapons? So they wouldn't let you in the gang. So that's why you became an insurance agent. Well, connect that. What 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 happened between the two? Yeah. The two victors. <laughs> so what happened there is I never really joined the gang because I was always, you know, in street fights with them. And, uh. A lot of the times, I spent a lot of time inside of my home, so just kind of minding my own business. I played a little bit of hockey because at the time, it was Disneyland was sponsoring Disney Bowls. So they gave us all kinds of free hockey gear, and I freaking loved it. So that kept me out of it a little bit. I wasn't always the best in school. Teachers used to really get annoyed by me 
to say the least. Yeah, I was and uh, but the teachers really kind of liked me. I just wasn't their best student, but I was likable. And I came across a teacher that was my woodshop teacher. And this guy just really demanded so much respect that he just earned from everybody. And he kind of uh, switched me around a little bit because he wouldn't really get on my case like my English teacher would, my math teacher would. If I was doing something, he goes, oh, you, he goes, oh you're, you're drawing graffiti on, 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 your, on a piece of paper. Here, let me show you how to use this machine to create this in 3D. Ooh. I'm like, oh, okay. I'm like, that sounds cool. So yeah. next thing you know, he had me, you know, working on wood and, you know, chopping up all kinds of stuff, making all kinds of things and, you know, chairs for my mom. And uh, he was just so nice. I just always really respected the guy. And I never really caused any drama in his class. But, you know, everybody assumed that eventually I was going to exit high school and just go into construction just because I was very good with woodworking. And it didn't really go that way. I ended up uh, working for a for a little shop changing oil. So, and that's where I spent ah, about six years of my youth, you know, working at a repair shop. Very quickly, they found out that I was a better talker than a mechanic. So they had me doing more sales and uh, talking to the clients. And I got into insurance because of my insurance agent at the time. He kept on wanting to hire me. And I kept on declining because I was just, I just knew that one day I was going to have my own repair shop and build hot rods, which nice. I didn't. And <laughs> he, he kept on telling me that that was not going to happen. And finally, I believed it. And I went and got licensed. But unfortunately, he already had staffed up. But he referred me to a friend of his. What a jerk. So I ended up, yeah. <laughs> I ended up being with the guy for like 11 years. And uh, it was super awesome. And that's how I ended up becoming an insurance guy. I just ended up really, I, I guess I was just really good at it. That's correct. So the guy constantly was trying to get you by the time he beat it into you that like, this was the thing to do. He's like, nah, yeah, I don't have room for you. Yeah, pretty much. That's exactly how it happened, but, but it all worked out really well. Yeah. I mean, it was the catalyst that created the movement for him to become one anyway. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. But the, the funny thing is he was pissed off. He's like, God damn it, Victor. He goes, didn't, he goes, didn't I tell you that to come work for me? He goes, I told you last week. He goes, I just hired this new person. And here you are with your freaking license now. I can't afford it. He's like, and I'm like, okay, well, you know, let me know when something's available. He's like, hang on, I'm going to make a phone call. So he calls uh, his one of his friends that just uh, bought an agency. He's like, I got this kid. I really, really like him. I think you should interview him. Nice. And uh, he's like, he goes, you doing anything right now? I'm like, no. He goes, you're going in for an interview. I'm like, but I'm not dressed for an interview. He's like, it doesn't matter. Just go down there. So I went down there smelling like freaking oil because, uh, you know, I had just gotten out of work and I sat down for an interview and uh, I got the job. On the, I got the job there. And then that is awesome. How long were you so at that, that agency? 11 years, 11 years. And then so you built up some good chops during that that period of time, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So during the time when I came in, not knowing anything, organized office it was uh, what they at the time was called a mega agency. So everything was very, very uh structure the owner was uh only about five years older than me at the time but he was very into technology so he who really <laughs> ross gilo who ross gilo oh yeah okay i know i actually know ross perfect i know you know <laughs> ross <laughs> so, yeah i mean i'm in i'm in huntington beach so i'm like we're like right here that's awesome dude. yeah yeah so I, I worked with ross for a long time Ross, uh, Ross to me was like a big brother. I still kind of like think about him every once in a while for him and his family. You know, it was, uh, it was very hard for me to approach him and say, Hey, I'm kind of moving on. It was like one of the hardest breakups I ever had to go through. But ultimately, you know, the, we, uh, we we're both adults. We talked about it and he ultimately knew that I had outgrown producer position and, you know, he wished me well. I still chit chat with him every once in a while, ask cool. him, ask him for advice. And, uh, even then, um, now, if I'm going to make a big decision, I would just stop and think about what would Ross do? Nice. <laughs> so I'd like to p extract a couple items from that because I think that they're like this worked out right for everybody involved. But there's a couple of things there that I think are common amongst agents. I know that I've made the si similar mistakes multiple times. I'm sure everybody on here has two things. He finally convinced you to, to do it. Then he, he decided not to, because he said he had just hired somebody. Something yes. that I've learned is 
there's always room for somebody if they're going to be good, right? Like this guy was convinced you would be good. And clearly you, you were, and you have been right because of where you landed. So he made a mistake there, right? Like that guy should have brought you on. Like there's, there's no reason because somebody will pay for themselves if they're good. And then I, I, I think he did. Uh, I, I ultimately understood his office was very, very small. It was not a big agent. Yeah. Um, and that's, I that's what the, keeps them small. That's that's why agents yeah. stay at a million. Twenty years later, they're at a million and a half in premium. It's because they don't make those decisions like this. And this wasn't like it was a on the spot decision. He'd been working you for freaking a long time, right? Yeah. Like, and then at yeah. the last second, oh, it's this. It's that scarcity. You know, the fearful money thing. It's like ah, oh, but uh, if I spend that, then what? What's the worst that that, that can happen? You're out of six grand, right? 10 grand, I whatever. Know, I probably know who that agent is, but well, so there, right, there's that first thing. Then the second retired, agent, huh? the second agent made somewhat of a mistake in that he hired you on the spot. Like that's too fast, right? Well, he, he did have some some insight from the other guy. I think that's helpful. He, he, he did, he did. So the other agent, the the thing about him was he was just taking over the uh the, the agency. So the original owner of this big agency was retiring. So Ross was just taking over. So I interviewed with both him and the, gotcha. and Ross. Um, so Ross followed the guidance from the previous owner who yeah. had the relationship with uh, the agent that referred to me. And Ross was at the time looking, you know, to uh, add some staff, hire his own person. And right. uh, I just checked off everything on his uh, on his wish list. Yeah. And uh, so they offered me the job and, you know, I really, it was probably one of the biggest uh, life changing things for me because at the time being a mechanic, I smoked cigarettes like a freaking chimney. <laughs> you know, I had oil underneath my fingernails every time working in an office environment was completely different because I had to watch my vocabulary because, <laughs> you know, I'm not a mechanic anymore. <laughs> <laughs> then, you know, how to dress very nice, which I usually didn't have like work clothes. I had a lot of clothes to go out on a Saturday and Sunday nights, but not work clothes. So I had to go acquire all of that. But it allowed me to kind of like start learning how to dress myself up better. And the one thing that, I, that I'm always going to be grateful for is I quit smoking just oh. because everybody in there smelled like freaking Dujin and Gabbana. And here I am smelling like a freaking ashtray covered yeah. in Burberry. <laughs> so it's not a good mixture so it, it was it, i started feeling a little embarrassed about that so and then i was working with people who just had a better way of communicating their language mm. was better so you know i hung around with a lot of the people that were successful there and i learned a lot from everybody there i changed my vocabulary i can talk better and i quit smoking so my whole personality just changed being in that office. I, I was a that. whole nother person. So yeah. that's why I was saying, if my teachers found out what I was doing now, I shocked the shit out of them. Yeah. <laughs> and they'd be like, you, you're what? <laughs> like, wait, you never, learned, you never learned that vocabulary from us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. I, I came from prior to doing, um, bef before this agency, I, I bartended for 10 years straight so same kind of scenario like like the fact that i could even work during normal business hours and not have to like sleep halfway through the morning to like noon to, you know what i mean so it's like yeah like i actually got real sleep and like i wasn't around a bunch of negative people that in the back were like yelling and cussing at everybody and like just being in an environment that it's like calm kind of yeah. you know what i mean like normal calm like it's just, completely different it completely dude. different it just teaches you a whole another world that you would have never been privileged to yeah had you not been involved it's I love it. those folks that that where there is that negativity like how it affects you right like oh you, it, it is it, it's a, it's proven you know if you if you hang out with a whole bunch of bums you hey you're gonna be <laughs> bum number six eventually right you yeah. hang out with a whole bunch of guys that are you know driven to success you know sales driven goal driven you know they have like something that they look forward to in life you'll eventually become the fifth or seventh person in there in that yep. group so that's that's ultimately what happens i still communicate with every single one of my staff the staff members there we're still friends super cool
So it's uh, it was it was super it was super cool, man. I I am that's why I was saying that to me. I always wish it would just be a better company and do more for its agents because deep down I want to see that company succeed just because everything it gave me. Love it, dude. So tell us. So you learned a lot during that period that you were at Ross's office. Mm-hmm. You got inspired to to open your own agency. When did you decide to take the leap? And how was that transition now wearing not only the salesman hat, but all the other fun hats as a donor? <laughs> so it, it um it, it all it all came down to this. At the time, I had I have a friend and uh, he worked for the farmer's district office and he was given an opportunity to acquire a small agency. And then they told him, hey, if you hit these goals by the end of the year, you can keep this agency at zero expense to you. So he approached me and he goes, hey, what do you want to make per hour to come work for me? Because I, I really need to hit these goals. I was like, you know what? I can't take, I can't do that. I work for Ross. I'm very happy here. I'm very stable. I would not do that. But I offered to help him out on the weekends. I'm like, hey, man, I'm off on Saturday. And then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, you know, I'm off at five. So I'll go to your office and make some phone calls for you. I'll telemarket for you. And, um, you know, we'll see if I can uh, help you draw in some business and uh, just uh, give me 100% commission on some stuff that I sell for you. And he's like, all right, let's do it. So next thing you know, this is the first, you know, because at first I was like, you know, farmer sucks. You know, we <laughs> smoke them all the time. You know, like. You know, I, I hear all these bad stories about farmers. You know, it was never in my mind to be a farmer's agent. But I went to go work for him. And then at that point, that's when I started quoting with farmers. And I was like, oh, you know, this isn't that bad. Like, after all, oh, you guys do home insurance on your own paper. Oh, you start, you do this on your own paper. So I started writing a whole bunch of stuff. And next thing you know, his name is becoming on the leaderboards. And his district office is asking him, hey, what the hell changed? Well, your name is now starting to pop up on the leaderboards when it didn't before. They were genuinely curious. He's like, I got a new telemarketer. So once he hit his goal, we were parting ways. He says, hey, my district office wants to meet you. So I said, okay, well, let's uh, let's see what they got. And I never really looked into anything like this. But sure, let's, uh, let's hear them out. So I met up with them on Saturday, maybe a Friday. And they ran it. They ran the whole thing by me. It's like, hey, we can sell you an office. We got this program, that program, and something that I thought was so far away and as as far as being impossible. Next thing you know, it was possible. So I told him I need some time to look into this. But then I found out that I had to have a business degree. I needed a hundred grand, and they had all these very strict requirements. And I was like, well, that sounds like I'm not going to become it. You know, farmers offered me an agency that was small enough at my budget range. You know, mm. being a producer, you're not really making a whole lot, regardless how how much you sell. You're not making, you're not killing it. And uh, as far as money wise. So I decided, I was like, you know what? I talked to my wife. We just had a baby. And I'm like, you know, things have to change. You know, if we're going to take a chance, I got to, I got to do it right now. So I called my district manager at the, t- this now I call him I'm like, Hey, let's do it. Let's do it. But uh, I'm like, one problem. How do I do this? without telling Ross, because the last thing I want is, you know, for all these loans and everything to fall apart. And I already kind of uh, gave my 60 day notice and then I can't retract that. So I kind of, I kind of hid it away from him for a little bit, just, just until I found out that everything had gone through. And once it got through, I had a very good conversation with them and uh, I came to come, you know, to my own office. When did you open that? Four years exactly today. So today's my fourth year anniversary. Oh, oh, really? Happy anniversary. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. So it's so, been four years. So you come in, you start. Like, what was it like? What happened? What was so, the first big giant win that you're like, this is it. I love it. <laughs> well, first of all, I've never seen so much money deposited into my account when they dumped my first folio payment. <laughs> and I was like, oh, geez. I'm like, okay. This is exciting. <laughs> I think it wasn't even a lot. It was like six grand at the time. But to me, it was a super exciting moment. But <laughs> And they dumped it like a month before because theoretically I took over a month before, even though I went live on 3-1. So that was like the the most exciting part. But when I got here, it was just exciting because I had spent the past 30 days building out my office. You know, it was being remodeled. Like, you know, the, the, person, the people who I bought it from, they had nothing but old furniture. It was just an old joint. So I took everything to the dump, 
painted it, got new carpet, new furniture, brought some modern t- computers and some modern phones in here. And uh, my first day was just super, super excited to be here. And then I asked, because the agent was here for with me for about 30 days before she finally retired, tell me during uh, that transition. And I asked her, hey, uh, you know, do, how, how often do the phones ring here? And she goes, well, we get about two, three calls a, a day. I was like, really? I thought the phones weren't working. <laughs> so I, I, I contacted Vaughn. I was like, man, didn't I ask you guys to have everything ready by today? I'm like, my phones <laughs> haven't been ringing. And they're like, no, sir, they're ringing. And so I called myself every like five minutes. And then finally we got a phone call and I introduced myself as the agent. And that was pretty neat. And then I had a customer walk in and he's like, hey, I know the old agent retired, but uh, he goes, I wanted to meet you. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. You know, so I got to meet him. And uh, then it just kind of became real, really real to me. But yeah. my office was small enough where it was just me by myself at the time. So just like I was a customer at Ross's office, I came in with slacks, dress pants, and uh, then I realized I'm in here by myself. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna untuck my shirt now. <laughs> I was like, I'm like, okay, I can this. I, I don't, I don't think I, I can, uh, you know, in a dress shirt every single day sitting here by myself. Right. So I started, you know, kind of loosening up a little. Coming in. I uh, called some people that I knew. I'm like, hey, let me give you a quote. And I started writing some policies. And it was it was pretty fun. Like, my first week was like, super exciting to be here. It was a pretty fun experience my first week. 